If you would like to turn with me in your Bibles, please, and you have Bibles tonight, and the reading is going to be taken from Jonah chapter 1, and I'd like you all, if you can, keep your Bibles open, and I will be explained how I'll be preaching from it, and it's always good when the preacher's preaching for you to have it in, open in front of you, because then you know if he's talking bonkum or not. So the first one that finds the book of Jonah... Page 928. The most delightful sound is the rustling of those pages. <laughs> Jonah has run away from God. God has sent a storm. Sailors have found out who, who was responsible. And so we take up the account from verse 15. Then they, the sailors, took Jonah and threw him overboard, and the raging sea grew calm. At this the men greatly feared the Lord, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord, and made vows to him. Now the Lord provided a huge fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. From inside the fish, Jonah prayed to the Lord his God. He said, In my distress I called to the Lord, and he answered me. From deep in the realm of the dead, I called for help. And you listened to my cry. You hurled me into the depths, into the very heart of the seas. And the currents swirled about me. All your waves and breakers swept over me. I said, I've been banished from your sight. Yet I will look again towards your holy temple. The engulfing waters threatened me. The deep surrounded me. Seaweed was wrapped around my head. To the roots of the mountains I sank down. The earth beneath barred me in forever. But you, O oh Lord my God, brought my life up from the pit. When my life was ebbing away, I remembered you, Lord. And my prayer arose to you, to your holy temple. Those who cling to worthless idols turn away from God's love for them. But I, with shouts of grateful praise, will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed, I will make good. I will say, salvation comes from the Lord. And the Lord commanded the fish, and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. Let's pray. <coughs> Father, we thank you for those familiar words. Words of an account that we probably heard in Sunday school. About the errant prophet. the God who would not let him go. Father, we thank you for that. We thank you. We ask now that as we look into it, that you would anoint me to speak, <coughs> and all our hearts that we might receive from you, that which you desire us to hear. Father, we thank you. Through Jesus. Amen. Now Jonah had been, called by, had been called by God to preach to the people of Nineveh. The wicked, aggressive, cruel Assyrians. Now he wasn't afraid to go. Rather, he hated the Assyrians. They were oppressing his own people. They were threatening, or maybe even had already, 
destroyed his hometown of Gath-Hefa in Galilee, which they did. He hated them, and he was afraid that if he preached to them, they might repent, and God might forgive them. That's the last thing he wanted. He wanted God to rain down sulfur and all the fires of hell on them. Well, this little book of Jonah is a wonderful insight, both into the heart of God and also into what he expects of those he's called. At this point, I'll, I'll just remind what I said this morning. God didn't just call the preacher. God didn't just call the deacons. God has called each and every one of us. He's gifted us and equipped us to serve. So God has called you. So don't switch off. Jonah had heard the call of God. The word of, God, of the Lord came to him. Jonah heard it and set off in the opposite direction. But God had called him and he wasn't going to let him get away with it. God loved Jonah, but he had some lessons to learn. Not least about obedience. God is love. But we need to remember that God is God. He isn't a big Father Christmas in the sky. He isn't there to provide for our every whim. He is God. We were created for his pleasure. He wasn't created for our pleasure. We were created for his. He is the creator. We are the creatures. He is God and he expects obedience from each and every human being. And he particularly expects obedience from those who claim to be his people. He loves us, but he is God. Now Jonah had some lessons to learn. But he had run away. He turned his back on God. He wasn't listening. Psalm 95 could have been written for him. Today, if only you would hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Now Jonah hardened his heart against the Assyrians. And in doing so, he hardened his heart against God. As we say, see here, God had to do something drastic to bring Jonah to a place where he would listen. Does God have to do similar to you and to me to wake us up? We saw last time how God provided a great wind on the sea a wind that stirred up a tempest. The ship was in danger of breaking up. So the pagan sailors cast lots to see who was responsible. It might sound primitive, but God was working to bring about his will. He engineered it so that Jonah had to admit that it was because of him that they had to throw their cargo into the sea. It was because of him that the ship and the crew were, were in danger now. God was engineering his will. And in the end, those sailors, whether they liked it or not, had to throw Jonah into the sea. Those pagan sailors had lost their cargo. But in doing this, they were blessed. Because they came to a personal faith in the Lord. Verse 16, they offered a sacrifice, made vows, they committed themselves to God. God had provided the storm. And now that Jonah had been thrown into the sea, God provided a 
huge fish. And that word provided is one that appears several times in this book. It's an important word. God provided the storm. God provided this huge fish. Remember, God is God. And as creator of the universe, he's quite capable of creating or providing such a creature and quite able to keep Jonah alive for three days and three nights in its belly. God is God. So verse 17, the Lord provided a huge fish to swallow the rebellious prophet. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights. Now you might think that it took three days and three nights for that fish to swim to dry land. But I put it to you that that wasn't the reason. Remember that God is able to do anything. In the Gospel of John, when Jesus walked on water to demonstrate to his disciples who he is, the moment that he got into the boat, John tells us, immediately they were at the other side of the lake. Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights, but it was for his benefit. Now the Lord now had Jonah where he wanted him. He wanted to bring the prophet back to his senses and bring him into a place where he would listen. Today, if only you would hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For Jonah, the belly of that fish was a naughty step. God had to take him aside to think, to realise, and get into a, into a position where he would listen. Now there are times when God will take his children aside and try to make them listen. He won't interfere with our free will, but he will corner us. And if he does, it's for our benefit. You might find yourself laid aside for any reason. Always ask, Lord, what have you to say to me? Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Jonah was in the belly of that fish three days and three nights, and it would have been far from pleasant. But he got to the point where he came to his senses. He got to the point where he would listen. It took the storm, it took being in the belly of that fish for three days and three nights to soften his heart. How much will it take to soften yours? Jonah got to the point when he did pray. The Holy Spirit brought it back to his remembrance. So we've got it here. Verse 1, chapter 2. From inside the fish, Jonah prayed to the Lord his God. And that was a great victory, because Jonah had been running away. Jonah had been in abject rebellion, but now he was repentant. He turned his back on God, but now he turned his face towards him on bended knee. In my distress, I called to the Lord, and he answered me. He acknowledged that this was the Lord's doing. Verse three: You hurled me into the depths, of, into the depths, into the very heart of the seas, and the currents swirled around me. All your waves and breakers swept over me. Verse five: The engulfing waters threatened me. The deep surrounded me. Seaweed was wrapped around my head. When my life was ebbing away, 
I remember you, Lord, and my prayers rose to you. God had to bring Jonah to this point. He loved his errant prophet, but God is God and he will have obedience. It has to be on his terms and it's better to learn that sooner rather than later. And then we get the crowning glory of the passage in verses 8 and 9. Those who cling to worthless idols, to false gods, they turn away from God's love for them. See that? God's love is streaming to all of us. Those who go after false gods turn away from that love. There's nobody who God does not love to reach out to. Those who claim to work as idols turn away from God's love for them. As do we when we choose to disobey, when we put ourselves outside of God's will and rebelliously choose to go our own way. Then, but I with shouts of grateful praise will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed I will make good. I will say, salvation comes from the Lord. Now could you imagine the joy of the Lord at hearing Jonah's prayer? Jesus said that there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels over one sinner who repents. Note that Jesus said there that there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels. So it isn't the angels who are rejoicing, though I'm sure they join in. The rejoicing is in their presence. It's actually God who rejoices whenever we turn back to him. And I am certain that God was rejoicing now that he got his prophet back. And then we come to our first passage from John 10. There, Jesus not only declares his identity, and those who like the Jehovah's Witnesses, who say that Jesus never claimed to be God, are so wrong. The Jews said to him, you, a mere man, claim to be God. They knew what he was claiming, because they tried to kill him for it. They accused him of blasphemy. And if it were not true, if he were not God, he would have been blaspheming. Jesus knew who he is and claimed it. Earlier on he says, Before Abraham was born, I am. Now that's not bad grammar. That's the divine name. I am the holiest name for God, the one that the Jews wouldn't even pronounce. And Jesus claimed it for himself. And there, again, they tried to kill him for saying it. Not only did Jesus claim to be God, he said to the people who were challenging him, you do not believe because you are not my sheep. They asked if he were the Messiah, but they didn't really want to know. Their hearts were hard. They wanted God to fit in with them. They wanted God to do their bidding. The Jews of Jesus' day wanted the Romans kicking out of the land and the Jewish kingdom restoring. They wanted God to do their, their bidding. They didn't want to be his, his sheep. Today, if only you would hear his voice, do not harden your heart. Their hearts were hard, and when Jesus didn't say what they wanted him to say, they picked up stones and tried to kill him. At the beginning of 
and look at the owner. The owner's eye was hard. The heart was hard. And when God didn't call him to do what he wanted to do, he ran away. So many people are like that today. So many Christians too. They forget that it's God that they're dealing with. They expect him to act on their terms. But God is God. And we come to him with soft hearts or not at all. Jesus said, My sheep listen to my voice. I know them. And they follow me. Jesus invites all to come. And if we will listen to his voice, if we will soften our hearts and come to him, we can become his sheep. He calls everyone, all, to come, to repent, to turn our faces towards him instead of our backs, to put our faith, our absolute trust in him. Jesus is the good shepherd who laid down his life for his sheep. Jesus laid down his life for you. He was and he is God. But he willingly submitted himself to the cross and all its horrors, taking our sin, our rebellion against God, our imperfections, everything that cuts us off from God. He took it all on himself and died for you. He made himself the sacrifice of atonement that covers, that washes our sins away, making us right with himself, right with God. My sheep hear my voice. They hear, they turn to him, they believe, they commit. Like those repentant pagan sailors, like Jonah, they make their vows to God. They commit themselves to Jesus, to God. And when we do, we're not disappointed. My sheep listen to my voice. Jesus said that. I know them, and they follow me. Jesus knows all who come to believe. He willingly accepts all who come with soft hearts. He accepts them as his sheep. We cease to go our own way and we follow him. We follow the good shepherd who said, I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. Just as Jesus was raised to life on Easter Sunday, just as he was resurrected, so the moment we believe, we begin to share in his resurrection. If we will become one of his sheep and follow him, he gives us life eternal. He opens the door to heaven for us. My sheep listen to my voice. This is what God wants of us. To listen to his voice, to obey him, to follow him. The mark of a true Christian is that they want to hear his voice. And they put themselves in a position where they can hear. You can say, I want to, I want to hear the voice of God. And then carry on just doing everything normal with your hands over your ears. If you want to hear God's voice, you'll spend time with him in secret, you'll pray, you'll read his word, and you'll listen. <clears throat> my sheep, listen to my voice, said Jesus. I know them, and they follow me. This is what God wants of us to listen to his voice to obey him to follow him the 
The mark of a true Christian is that they hear his voice and follow. The genuine sheep follow the shepherd. It's the goats who don't. Jesus wants those who will obey, who will accept the calling that God has placed on their lives and fulfill it. God had to, had to call a Jonah, get him into a cleft stick where he couldn't move before Jonah would soften his heart. We are each beloved of God. We are each called into service not as we desire, but as he calls. Jonah had initially accepted the call to be a prophet, to speak for God, to foretell his will. He had accepted the call, but he thought that he could be selective in his obedience. He had to learn that he couldn't, and nor can we. After three days in the belly of that great fish, not a pleasant place to be, Jonah came back to God. And at the end of his prayer, in repentance, he prayed, What I have vowed to the Lord, I will make good. Jonah had finally softened his heart and now he was listening. So the passage from Jonah 2 ends with the words, and the Lord commanded the fish, and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. <coughs> God loves you. The good shepherd gave his life for you. He has a calling just for you. He calls you, he desires you, he commands you to fulfil it. Don't be like Jonah. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for what we see in the prophet Jonah. Someone so human someone just like us. And Father, we thank you for the way that you dealt with him. You laid him aside in the belly of that fish and got him to the point where he would listen. Father, we would ask that you would soften our hearts, that we might be willing to listen and to serve that we might listen to the voice of the shepherd and follow. Grant us obedient hearts and the grace to submit our wills to yours. And this we do now in the name of Jesus. Amen. <laughs>